was born and raised there in, in, uh, in Redmond. My grandfather did purchase this piece of property back in the 1930s, and it had s some mineral deposits on it, which we didn't buy it for the minerals, we just bought it for the farm. But uh, there's a story in how we got developing the minerals, and, and that's what we'll talk about here today. But let me begin uh, by s saying some of the things that sometimes I forget, and they're rather important. One is, uh, I am not here to sell a product. I am not anti-doctor, and I'm not practicing medicine. I'm here to educate people as to another tool in the medical toolbox. Doesn't matter to me one iota whether any of you buy product that I talk about today or not, but I feel badly for people who try to raise kids or grandkids without Redmond Clay. I tell people, don't have kids on the property unless you've got Redmond Clay. That's how strongly I, I feel about it. So with that behind us, uh, let's talk about some, some products. Uh, and again, not to sell, but to educate. Though we're here mainly to talk about the Redmond Clay, I want to talk about uh, our salt. How many of you know or use real salt? How many of you like real salt? Okay, I do too, but I'll tell you this. If I could not have the real salt and the Redmond Clay, I would give up the real salt <laughs> before I'd give up the clay. With that said, let's go to Redmond Clay. I want to take you back to the early 1900s. The r pioneers had settled the town of Redmond, and there's this white outcropping of, of a, kind of a white soft rock there. And one of the old boys, one of the early pioneer kind of guys, found that he could go out there and take this whitish rock and make a mud or a poultice out of it, and he would use it to, to put on horses that had gotten in a barbed wire fence or maybe a cow that had you know fallen on a stick and he would heal these horses and cows with this poultice made of this stuff to where they called this Blix's mud. His name was Joe Blix and they called him Dr. Blix. He was no more of a doctor than my daughter's beagle but they called him Dr. Blix. My father who was born in 1917 there in the valley, little boy grown up in the 1920s had an infection in his hand with a red streak going up his arm into the armpit. My grandparents went out to this community property. It was community property then. And got some of this white dirt, made a mud or a poultice, and packed his hand in it, and overnight it sucked that red streak out. So the pioneers knew that it would do that, but as Joe Blix died, so did everything that Joe Blix had done. And it wasn't spoken of a lot. The pioneers, uh, even I did not hear this story about my father's arm until uh, in the 1970s. And so now we'll fast forward to 1970. This is uh, mid-1970s. Well, because our name was Redmond Clay and Salt, as we started working with these health food stores, they said, and they were just buying our salt, they said, clay, you, clay and salt, you have clay? We said, yeah. They said, well, will your clay do what the French clay does? And we said, what does the French clay do? We didn't know there was a French clay. <laughs> they brought us this book entitled Our Earth, Our Cure. It was written in, 19, in the 1950s by a French homeopath. And it was translated into English in 1974, brought to us in 1975. And the health food people said, will your clay do what this French clay will do? They showed us the index. And for a page and a half of the index, it talks about clay. This French homeopath, this Raymond Dextrate, said that the right kind of clay would bring the body into balance. That it was, he actually called it alive, because it'll do one thing for you, something else for you, and something else for you. Whatever you need, it, that's what it does for you. It brings you into the center, into balance. So we had it tested. We took our clay, had it tested, uh, and analyzed to make sure it wasn't harmful, it wasn't going to kill anybody. We checked with the food and drug, and they said it's inert. It's not going to hurt anybody, but it certainly isn't going to help anybody either. So we thought, okay, now we know it's safe. Yes, you can buy it. So we took this white rock, we pulverized it, made it like a, a fine uh, dry powder, similar to the, the French clay, and we put it on the shelf. That's where it stayed. <laughs> <laughs> The few f health food stores who had been asking for it, they took some. But basically, I mean, nobody walked in and to buy, buy clay. 
but it was there on the shelf. Well then, as we encountered, over the next few months, as we encountered uh, medical conditions that traditional medicine couldn't fix, then in desperation, we turned to our Redmond clay. Some people came into the office to ask to buy some clay, first time ever. I mean, for somebody to walk into our office back in the mid-70s and ask to buy Redmond clay, it just didn't happen. <laughs> and I said to these people, what in the world do you want our clay for? They said they had been traveling in Egypt or Israel, somewhere in the Far East, uh, had gotten sick, gotten dysentery on the food or the water, and had gone to the pharmacy to buy something for this dysentery, and what they sold in that pharmacy was clay. Not Redmond clay, unfortunately, <laughs> but clay they sold in this pharmacy. And it worked so well that now they were back in Salt Lake, home, uh, wanted to get some clay, looked in the Utah business directory for a clay company, found us, came down, and I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> it helped diarrhea? And they said, fantastic. For the next, like I say, 20 years, it was, worked great. And again, we used it for everything. Uh, my parents went to Guatemala as humanitarian missionaries back in the 80s. And while they were down there, they were known as the mission doctors because any, any new missionaries that would come down there who were having trouble with the food or the water, they would bring them to my parents who would give them a glass of, of clay. And it would be over like that. People will come to me on a regular basis and say, did you know that your Edmund Clay helps this? And I'll say, what is that? I've never heard of that disease. <laughs> and they'll say, well, this is what it is, and your Edmund Clay helps it. Great. So we add it to the list. Everything we've been talking about here is internal, but now what about external? Well, again, back in 1976, uh, we had this on the shelf. The book says it'll help external things. So it was in the kitchen cupboard. So as we encountered some crisis, then we would turn to it. The first one was a burn. Our little boy, just learning how to walk, had uh, toddled over. I had just turned off my lawnmower and, and turned to put the, something in the garbage can, and I heard him scream. And I wheeled around, and he had toddled over and leaned forward and put his one hand on the muffler of the lawnmower. As I picked him up, you could see the imprint, the shape. His hand was just all white, but you could see the design of the muffler on his little hand. His mother heard him scream, and this is our first child, and I said he burned his hand, grabbed the clay. She just ran in the, in the house, grabbed this jar of clay, and we stuck his little hand right down in the jar. Of course, the hand came out totally covered in clay, and then we took a handkerchief, got a handkerchief wet, and wrapped around it to keep it moist and, and on there. Within five minutes, this little guy has quit crying. Five minutes. Within 10 minutes, he's back to toddling around with his wet handkerchief on his hand. He slept through the night. The next morning, we got the, the handkerchief was really quite dry. We got it good and wet, took it off, washed his hands. You could not tell which hand had been burnt. In the 35 years of using it, we've never seen an allergic reaction. We've never seen a negative side effect. And we've used it for a lot of things. For every story I tell you, I've got 10 more or 20 more that I won't tell you because of lack of time.